Hello. Um, so, I'm Matthew. Uh, this is Alan. Um, so, we work in the data engineering team at Man Quant Technology. Um, so, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about how we use data, um, how we use technology, and how the combination of the two effectively powers our systematic trading business. Uh, so, so, what we're going to run through is I'll give you a quick overview of what the business actually is, what we actually do. Um, we'll go through the actual data that we use. I'll tell you how effectively how it flows through our, pipe, eh, through our pipes, um, how we store huge amounts of the data, and finally, we will go into how we actually use it. So, to start with, uh, so we are low to medium frequency systematic traders. So, what that means is we're systematic traders. That means that we are buying and selling securities in a systematic fashion. We do not have discretionary traders who are taking a view of the market and deciding what to buy and sell. Instead, everything is traded systematically, i.e. we have computers doing it all for us. We're low to medium frequency traders. What that means is the positions that we hold, we tend to hold for between uh, a few hours for kind of medium frequency intraday trading to weeks or months on the more low end of the spectrum. Um, we're not high-frequency traders. We're not uh, issuing 100 orders a second. We're not trying to respond to market events like immediately. That isn't our business. Um, from the technology standpoint, that means we're not as sensitive to latency as people seem to think we are or, or we should be. Um, so this is kind of like a very high-level overview of the business. Um, the main story it's kind of trying to get across is that everything starts with data. So we ingest data from the outside. And we really do two things with that data. We obviously have a team of researchers who look at that data and produce trading strategies. And those trading strategies also obviously run in production. They are also fed to the data that we ingest from the outside. And they spit out trades. Um, so a trade is, for example, buying five stocks of Google shares or Microsoft shares or buying natural gas, something like that. Um, so the strategy's only uh, task in life really is to, out, is to look at the data that's being fed into them and to output these trades. Those trades then flow through to execution. This is where we, we find a counterparty for the trade. Um, so it might go through to a broker, through to an exchange. Um, execution is actually quite a complex pipeline. It involves us trying to minimize our trading costs and ensure that uh, the price that we trade at is actually the price we thought we could trade at when the strategy was running and when the strategy was actually looking at the data that was being fed through to it. Um, the end goal, as you can probably imagine, is we want to make a profit on the trades that we make. Um, buy low, sell high, it's, yeah, it's like the old adage, it's kind of that, to be honest. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we're going to make a profit. Um, cool, so we're going to take a look at some of the data that we actually use. So I'm sure lots of you have seen graphs similar to this before. So what this is, is this is the closing price of a stock, in this case, Alphabet stock, every day over the course of the entire year. Um, so the closing price is the price of the final transaction made on an exchange before the exchange closed, uh, closes for business that day. Um, so the closing price is actually quite useful to kind of identify overall trends over a large period of time, by year, year. But as you can imagine, you can get much higher fidelity data than that. If you imagine how an exchange actually kind of mediates between buyers and sellers and allows you to decide what, you, what securities you actually want to potentially buy, um, you might come up with what is effectively called an order book. So an exchange will maintain a data structure, which if you draw visually and put on a PowerPoint slide, will look a little bit like that. Um, effectively, it keeps track of all the sell orders and all the buy orders. An order simply indicates what price someone wants to buy something at and how many units they want to buy at. Um, so what, what we really want is we want this order book. Um, but we have, different, we have different sorts of strategies. Some price level strategies are only interested in what is effectively the buy and or the bid and the ask. Um, so the sell order at the lowest price has the highest priority, and the buy order at the highest price has the highest priority. Um, hopefully that kind of makes intuitive sense for whoever is willing to pay the most or whoever is willing to sell for the least amount are going to be the first to actually transact. So some of our strategies only care about the ask, which is the lowest sell, or the bid, which is the highest buy. In other words, we only want to see when those two orders change. Other strategies might want, might want to look, kind of look at different level of data. So others might want the, the top three levels on the sell side, the top three levels on the buy side, or some of our trading strategies might actually be able to make use of the entire order book. Um, so what we do is we have agreements with, with lots of different data vendors, and they're effectively going to stream us updates to these order books for all the different securities that we're interested in. So what that update looks like is it looks, 
kind of something like this. So this is what we call a market data tick. A market data tick is effectively an encoded update to that order book. So this particular tick says the new bid price, i.e. the buy order at the highest price is 30.55. Uh, there's now seven units available at that price, kind of vice versa on the sell side. Um, and the last price that was actually transacted at was 30.55, and five units were transacted. Um, so this is a uh, level one market data stream. So effectively what, that, what level, all level one means is that we're not seeing the entire view of the order book. In this case, this particular stream is only giving us updates to the bid and the ask. Um, as you can imagine, for particularly liquid securities, we may get thousands of these updates or thousands of these market data ticks uh, every single second. Um, and over time, this effectively forms a price series or time series. And this is what we want to be able to store, to archive, and we never really want to throw any of this data away under any circumstances. Yep, so it kind of forms a time series, T, T minus one, T minus two. Um, over the course of the day, across all of our subscriptions, we process well over a billion, and particularly busy days will be maybe double that. Um, there's another side of the data story here that we're interested in. We also care about what we call reference data. It's effectively just metadata for the time series. Um, so, for example, uh, the fact that what this time series is actually referring to is Alphabet Inc. Class A stock, the fact that it's traded on the NASDAQ, the fact that the issuer is Alphabet Inc., the fact that it's a US dollar denominated, uh, CDOT and QTIP are two identifiers for the security. This is all reference data, and it's actually really important for us to be able to store this and to make sense of it, as without this, we have absolutely no idea what the price data is that we're looking at. Also, this changes over time. Google is quite a good example of this. In 2015, Google Inc. was known as Google Inc. Then there was what's called a corporate action, and after that corporate action, Google was effectively spun out as a subsidiary of Alphabet. We actually want to be able to understand how this has changed over time. So when we're looking at the time series, we can actually make sense of it and understand that the security it's referring to, what it was referring to at that point in time. Um, so just to kind of drive home um, how things do change over time and how financial relationships really can be quite complex, you don't need to understand this, um, but this is just trying to get across the message that we want to be able to understand what we're trading and how it relates to other things. Financial relationships can be very complex and they can change over time and we want to be able to effectively query this graph at a given point in time and see what the truth of the world is. Um, cool. So the high level game plan, what we're actually trying to do is we have effectively a split environment. We have a research environment and we have a production trading environment. In research, we're going to take all of that streaming market data and we're going to stuff it in our, uh, in our uh, time series store, which we call Arctic. We're gonna take the reference data, we're gonna put that in what we call our security master. We're gonna take anything else that doesn't really fit into those two categories. Uh, so I've just kind of cheated and called it exotic data sets here, but that really could be anything. It could be agricultural crop fields. It could be kind of anonymized credit card data. Um, anything that is going to help our researchers identify alpha and allow us to produce a trading strategy which will be profitable. We're going to put all of that data in Arctic, which is our long-term time series store. In research, they have access to the full view of the data, and the researchers are going to produce trading strategies. We're going to then take those trading strategies, productionize them, and put them in production, where they'll have access to a much more limited set of that data. Um, obviously, in production, they are going to then spit out trades, which are going to flow through to ex through execution, which is what I briefly described before, all the way through to the marketplace, where they will actually be transacted on. So that's kind of a very high-level game plan. Um, so what we're going to go through now is I'll tell you how Arctic works, that's our kind of time series store, and how the security master works, which is our reference data store. So the security master is where we keep our reference data. Um, it's, it's effectively kind of a very flexible data linkage engine. What it allows us to do is it allows us to understand vendor data and it allows us to map between identifiers. So those are identifiers for a security, i.e. maybe the ticker name or CDOL or QSIP. Um, mapping between identifiers sounds quite simple. Um, it's actually quite complex and it's incredibly important that we can do it well because we onboard data from a variety of different vendors. Generally, these vendors disagree on what naming symbology to use and it's very important that we can understand the data we're actually looking at. It also allows us to model financial relationships, similar to what we showed you before. So we might want to understand what option contracts are available against the security, uh, as well as maybe the issue of a certain security. And we want all of this to be available to us and not have to take days or weeks to actually get to grips with and understand. 
is fundamentally bitemporal. This means the graph that you saw before, we can ask what it looks like at a given point in time. Um, also, we can understand when that graph itself has changed. That's particularly important in research. If you're running a long backtest on Monday and Tuesday, what you don't want to happen is to see the results of that backtest changing wildly and not understand why. So we can fix this data for a given point in time, so you can run it as many times as you want, and you actually know what has changed. Um, cool, so Ala is going to tell you a little bit about Arctic now. Yep, so Arctic is the other side of the story. Uh, Security Master stores reference data, they're almost static data that does change, uh, though not that often. Uh, Arctic is our solution to storing time series data. Uh, it actually is open source, and that's a GitHub, and you can check it out, see if it's something that you can use for your projects. It's, it's a Python project. It focuses on storing data that's either tick data or data frames. And originally, we designed it to separated from the, the back-end storage engine. Uh, it has kind of grown attached to MongoDB, which is what we use internally. So MongoDB is fairly pervasive through, the, uh, through Arctic, but we're still keeping the idea of logical data stores. And the idea is that the APIs exposed from the logical data stores are the same, so our researchers can use them easily, but they store differently shaped data, they know how to deal with that data, and they're optimized for the storage. Two main types of um, the stores we use is the version store, which is specifically for storing data frames. It is just a very fast pipeline of taking the data frame or anything that's, that's NumPy representable, because ultimately it's a similar thing, uh, and putting it through into the, the Mongo backend. Um, the other type of store is a tick store that's actually for storing flowing ticks. Uh, it is a columnar store because simply that's been proven as the best solution to store ticking data. It's just a time frame with relevant floats uh, that go for the tick. Uh, tick store, uh, we are processing one to three billion ticks a day. Billion is something that's average. Three is on the days when announcements are made, especially the American ones. Uh, and across all of these stores in our Mongo databases, we have over 100 terabytes of um, data uh, that we manage, and it's across all of our clusters, uh, and it's probably one of the largest dates uh, in the world. Now, when we designed this, we did not intend to store this amount of data, and we did not intend for this um, use. Uh, so something that we have been working internally uh, for the last six months is something we call Arctic Native. It's a rewrite of the Arctic uh, using native techniques. It's written in C++. It comes as close to the bare bone hardware as you can get. Uh, it still exposes Python APIs, so our researchers do not see the difference. They only see the difference in speed up and access. Um, it, it's, it's fairly smart in the way it's been done, uh, and we are seeing massive improvements. So that's a graph. We're seeing orders of magnitude be faster reads and writes, better compression, uh, and we, we're getting to uh, two gig um, per second both reads and writes um, per worker and since it's um, C++ backend, we can spin out as many workers as you want. And again, Python APIs, everyone's used to them, so that's pretty cool. Now let's have a look at the actual streaming architecture, because we talked about the data and we talked about the storage. The streaming architecture, this is a, a, a very general overview of what the architecture looks like. Uh, we have data coming from vendors, it goes into a real-time messaging bus, we have tick collectors that collect those ticks. Uh, they go into Kafka, so Kafka is something that we use internally to, to isolate us from um, downstream failures. Um, then we have some tip processors, and the data eventually goes into tick stores and version stores. They, it gets available to both researchers and trading strategies and produces trades. Now, uh, ticks do originate on, in, uh, on exchanges, as Matt has mentioned, but for us, for all intents and purposes, they really come from data vendors. Uh, we have we have contracts with probably just about data vendor out there. Uh, they all provide data uni in a uniform format, so they write adapters for us. Sometimes we store the appliances in our data centers. Um, so ticks flow in a fairly uniform manner onto our real-time messaging bus. Uh, it's useful. You see there's a tick process over there. Sometimes we subscribe directly to it. Sometimes we use it for the rest of the system, but most of the time, uh, we put them as fast as possible onto Kafka because real-time messaging bus, when tick goes, it goes, it doesn't stay there. Um, tick collectors focus, it's really their purpose in life is just to collect the ticks as fast as possible. Uh, they, 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 they focus, um, they group them um, as, as we desire and then put them through onto the Kafka bus. 
uh, for further use. And Kafka data is replayable, Kafka data gets stored. If, if anything dies downstream from Kafka, we, we can't bring it up. Uh, so we have a certain amount of leeway with um, what's happening. And then we also have tick processes. And what tick processes do is not, not all the data that's required needs to be a very high frequency. So obviously tick data is extremely high frequency and, and researchers want access to that and some of the life uh, processes need that frequency, but, but most strategies don't. Uh, so what we do is process is usually downsample data. One of our main units of downsampling is one minute bars. They, they pull the data out uh, and then republish the one minute bars onto Kafka and the separate topics. Uh, market ticks, actual ticks go into tick store, gets available for researchers, and the downsample data goes into version store together with the, any results of uh, research work, and that becomes available for trading strategies in actual production and goes into live. Now, as I said, all ticks flow in a fairly uniform manner into the real-time messaging bus. That's up to our data providers to make sure that the ticks are uniform. Uh, as I said, the right uh, adapters for us. This is an example of what goes into the real-time messaging bus. Uh, it's, it's a tick, you can see the type is update, it means it's a delta from the previous tick. The alternative is an image which shows you the whole snapshot of all the fields. You can see how the data kind of matches to what Matt discussed as a tick that we see on the market. So you can see bid ask, um, bid price, um, buy and everything else and other, other data that's relevant to the tick and that this changes a lot. And we process more than a billion of these a day. Okay, so this is actually a, a screenshot of, uh, of our dashboard, uh, something that we use uh, in, in the company. This was one of the quieter days. You can see it's, what, about 1.2 billion ticks. Um, you can kind of see, uh, so that the, top, the top bit is showing the ticks on the Kafka. Uh, and you can see the quiet time in the, um, at night times. Um, then you could see this is Asia opens, and you can see there's a little spike in ticks. Um, then we, we have Europe. That's a bit more. US open, one of the biggest spikes, and actually one of the largest spikes is US close when everything, everyone consolidates their positions. Uh, and then we have to handle, obviously, the data flowing on a regular basis, but also handle the spikes. Uh, this one shows one minute bars. So one minute bars are the processes that run, with, they, they smooth out the data. You can see that they don't need to run straight away. And because data is in Kafka, we can just come along spin up a process and, and do it at our, in our own time as long as they become available when they need it. And the bottom bit is as our Mongo storage. Uh, so it's um, 114 terabytes, that's about 125 tera on this particular day. Uh, it's a cumulative graph uh, and that's across all our environments. So it's kind of going from dev environment where we don't have much and it's going up. And the, the top two are the research environment and the tech store, our biggest users of data. Okay, I think Yes, so I will, I will give you back to Matt and he will kind of look into more detail onto the Kafka side of the story and how the ticks get stored on there. So let's talk about everything that effectively happens after the real-time messaging bus. So as I said, we have tick collectors. So yeah, these tick collectors, tick collectors, their only job in life is to subscribe to the real-time messaging bus. They grab ticks off there, they package them in something we just call a market data message structure. Um, all that does is it just picks out uh, it picks out the symbol. So the symbol is probably going to be the name of the of the actual security, uh, but the name of the security may be the uh, exchange ticker, something like Google, without the e. Um, the date, uh, the type. So we get two types of ticks essentially. We either get update ticks, which just contain contain the delta of the order book, as I described before. We also do get image ticks. So these contain all of the fields and just tell you what the latest value for all of the fields at a given point in time is. We store the sequence number, which we get directly from the exchange, which ensures that we process ticks for a given security in the correct order, and everything else we dump into data. Um, so we're writing a lot of ticks to Kafka. We try and shard semi-intelligently. So the way we do that is we try and shard the same way effectively that Kafka does. So Kafka scales horizontally by increasing the number of partitions per topic, and you're writing and reading to these individual partitions. Each tick collector is a Java process, which has the same number of threads as we do partitions. We hash the symbol, that, so that the hash of the symbol then dictates which Kafka partition it is going to be written to, and also which thread is going to do the writing. 
Um, obviously, we need to use the same kind of hashing methodology on the read path. This is the write path. Well, this is quite useful because it means if you know what subset of symbols you want to start reading data from Kafka for, you only need to look in a subset of the partitions, which means you don't necessarily need to process every single message that we've written to Kafka for that topic. If you kind of look at what a cross-section of one of the partitions looks like, it looks a little bit like this. So obviously you have update messages for a number of given symbols, uh, and you have to read them in sequence. If you only want data, for example, Google, not Microsoft, and they both live in this partition, the downside to this is you have to pick and choose which messages you want and which messages you don't. Um, cool. So everything's on Kafka. The effectively only step remaining is to dump everything in Mongo for long-term storage and such that trading strategies can access it in production. So most ticks flow straight through to Arctic Tick Store, which is a store designed for tick level data. As I said, we have tick processors. What they are mostly doing here is they're pulling stuff of Kafka. They're resampling it to be of lower frequency. Uh, so it might be one minute data, 10 minute data, depending on the strategy, and republishing it back to Kafka. That, repub that republished, effectively, data frame that goes back into Kafka is then going to be written to Arctic version store. And from there, it's going to be made available to the trading strategies. So we do use Kafka quite heavily. We do rely on it quite a lot. It's been quite good to us. Um, it provides us what I effectively refer to as infrastructural isolation. Effectively, if everything downstream of Kafka dies, it's not the end of the world. As long as we can pick it up within a week, which we probably can do, we're not going to lose any data. If we didn't have Kafka and everything went down, all the ticks that flow through the real-time real -time messaging bus would be gone forever. It's not a disaster, but we don't want to lose data. We want to be able to try and retain as much as possible. Um, also, all of our resampling effectively happens via Kafka. We take things off Kafka, we resample it, we republish back to Kafka, and then we can use kind of a standard application just to copy it from Kafka to Mongo. Um, obviously, you get some of the advantages that you get for normal message buses, i.e. we can talk across languages. We have clients both in Java and Python that allow us to do all of this. Um, yeah, um, it does trade off latency for throughput. It's not a big deal for us, to be honest. If it takes five seconds for a tick to go all the way through the pipes, be downsampled, written to Arctic, and then for the training strategy to pick it up, that's, that's absolutely fine. That in itself is not an issue. So that's a good trade-off as far as we're concerned. Yeah. OK, so um, let's have a, just a quick look at some of the APIs, um, basically. Um, for the Kafka side, as we said, we have um, 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 producers who are producing um, in Java, just because it gives us the parallelism. Um, we can assign, as Matt said, we can assign each thread per, per um, partition, and we can write things really fast. Now, we're using Apache Kafka and the Kafka clients, uh, Maven um, plugins, they're just, they're just available uh, and easy to use. Uh, for Kafka consumer side, that's Python, so uh, we're using Kafka Python with a little bit of internal uh, magic uh, for, for Cython extensions, just, just to make the, the unpacking uh, faster. We use message pack um, to encode all the data, and message pack is really easy. It's literally that's all it takes to, to message pack and message pack out. Um, on the consumer side, we have a fairly thin wrapper on the, the Kafka consumer, and um, it, just, it just basically wraps it and provides a little bit of extra functionality. That's an example of one of the functions we would use. So for example, just to get time series, you can provide symbol library, date range, the fields you're interested in, and the host to read from. And it's, it uses the um, Kafka's uh, get messages uh, API to, to get a batch of messages and wrap them in a, in a Python data frame which is what um, our researchers use and like. Uh, Arctic, so Arctic is another side of the story. Arctic, again, uh, it's open source, and you can, if, you, if you actually look at these APIs, they're extremely simple. Uh, and the new Arctic, Arctic Native, has exactly the same interface, so there's, there's no difference. Uh, the only difference is, so Arctic Native, something I forgot to mention is, um, as, as I said, we kind of deteriorated into using Mongo very heavily. Uh, we have made a step away from that, so at the moment we are supporting LMDB for local storage, local caching, or you, just to store results of your local simulations. Uh, we use Mongo as a first-class citizen, obviously, we, 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 we have a lot of data there, and we use S3, uh, so S3 is kind of the future for us a little bit, and it's, uh, it's proven to be quite good. Uh, and the idea in the future is to support fully uh, intelligent tiered storage, uh, so data will flow through different storages without the user being aware uh, all the way up to the, the Glacier store for data that nobody kind of uses but 
I'm sure somebody in a year's time will suddenly need that data and you know, the library will read it for them. Uh, now again, we kind of have this get time series function. Researchers love it and use it. Uh, it provides a lot of points of customization. So in the, the, in the easiest format, you can say get time series for this symbol from this library. That's it, it does the work for you. Uh, there's other points of customization. You can filter on fields, you can get date ranges. You can say you don't want any duplicates or give you the snapshot of data as of some time in the past if you're doing uh, testing, filter holidays, various things and, and many more. Um, as a, as a, as a API type of thing, creating libraries is almost identical. So logical data stores, we, we, don't, we don't care. You just provide us the type and the magic happens. So you can use initialized library, version data. It defaults to version store, so that will create a version store. If you provide library type text store, that will create an optimized text store that deals with sparse data and stores and flows really well for you and everything gets compressed. Um, reading and writing, it's literally just read and write. Um, again, some of the points of customization which you get in time series are the same, you know, if you want date ranges and things like that. And get time series is a higher level function that researchers can use. And that's at the, at the, at the top, you can kind of see, this is an example of time series um, that, that the researchers would get outside of that function for a particular symbol. Um, you get just the times and then you get relevant uh, floats. You have your P, it's open, open, high, low, and the last. So that's the tick. Uh, and yeah, you might not have seen this slide, but yeah, or maybe you've seen it a lot. Uh, but that's, that, that is basically our architecture. Um, you know, it's, it, it's somewhat simple. Uh, it's also complete, not a complete view by far. It's, it's, it's kind of a small glimpse, and obviously there's a heavy focus on the data side and the ingestion side. Uh, but I, I hope it gave you an idea of how tech comes from vendors, goes into real-time messaging bars, gets collected, stores in Kafka for a little bit of reliability, and then we can come at our own time and process them, downsample them, uh, store everything, absolutely everything for researchers, and store a subset uh, for trading strategies. Um, I think, is it back to Matt? No, it's back to me, okay. Um, so yes, um, I, I, I hope you kind of noticed that I mean, we are a fairly large fund. We've been trading for, for a long time. Um, and we have, uh, we have billions of AUM, you know, I think about 100 billion. Uh, and all of that data is flowing through open source components. Uh, so Kafka, uh, MongoDB, our own open source. We use a lot of other open source uh, stuff inside. We, we do love it, we do embrace it. Um, we have our own um, large repository and it keeps growing. It's kind of like our target to grow it more and give back to the community. You can, you can just follow it and have a look. We also host PyData um, and machine learning meetups in London. Uh, it's at Monument, you know, they're free, you can come along and talk and chat and see if um, there's, there's anyone you, you know, there's anything interesting there. Uh, there's also something we're gonna do this year, we've done it before, uh, it's an open source hackathon. Uh, it's scheduled for the 2nd of November, it's gonna be 10 hours straight coding, we've moved away from the 24 hour session because it's just a little bit difficult for when you're in full time employment to, to code for 24 hours straight. Uh, so save the date. Well, it's fun if you're doing it for your own thing, but I think it's harder when it's somebody else's project. Um, so yeah, save the date and sign up and you know, come along and be fun. What, what we do is we invite contributors from open source projects uh, and you, know, you can join one of the groups that you're most interested in and just code with cool people um, and you know, solve some problem on a day and maybe meet some peeps. Uh, and last year we had contributors from Sumpi, SciPy, NumPy, Apache Arrow, um, yeah, just people like that. Um, I'm gonna open the floor to questions, but you know, if there's anything else, you can uh, come to our stand, we're right outside and ask us any more questions. Okay? Uh, let's all clap, please. Hi there. Uh, I know you mentioned, uh, or you've shown on one of the slides, uh, some data visualization. What do you use for that? Some data what? Data visualization. Oh, oh, that was just, sorry, do you mean? Or, yeah, that, that you mean for, for logging and monitoring? That's a simple Grafana, it's a monitoring visualization right. tool. Yeah, I talk about that. So just purely Grafana? That's just, that is just Grafana. Right. Nothing more, nothing less. And in terms of your microservices or services you have for collector and processors, yep. are these ones 
packaged as Docker containers or images yeah, yeah, yes. running on? So everything is Dockerized uh, running on the box. We use a fairly simple infrastructure, uh, Docker Compose effectively. So we don't use Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, I feel like I should specify that. Right. Um, so everything. We're, we're moving towards we're it. Moving Not towards yet. Kubernetes. We have been releasing a few things. So we have a research environment already supports Kubernetes containers. Uh, we are driving to release that. But our production is still just Docker Compose and kind of slightly in house way of, um, yeah. um, of releasing it. But everything is Dockerized, yes. And last one for real time processing, what, is, what are you using for there? What real time message bus? Um, that have? is a third party message bus, and I do not know if we're allowed to name it or not. I see. Okay. Which is a useless <laughs> answer, I know, but there you go. <laughs> okay, no worries. Cheers. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, so in, in, how long does data stay in Kafka on average? And what's the, um, the process like for getting data out of Kafka into MongoDB? Do you have like Kafka Connect syncs and stuff like that? Or is it stuff you've written yourself? Um, so it depends. it depends what the data vendor that we get it from is. It depends how much data flows through that particular pipe effectively. Because everything in Kafka is, is configured to store, not in length of time, but for a certain amount of disk space. So obviously it depends how much data is actually being stored there. I think in general it's between one and two weeks. Uh, as long as it's enough time for us to be able to handle an outage, that's what we care about most. Um, and that's hopefully plenty of time. Um, so now everything, the pipeline from Kafka through to Mongo is, it's all custom, it's all in-house. Um, it, it, it's not obviously massively complicated. Um, yeah. Are we talking a lot of pain, a little bit of pain? Um, <laughs> that's a fun question. Um, they're fine. They work. Hi there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I think you may have just answered the question, but um, I'm just wondering, uh, what's the process like in patching your tech store? in case you should drop messages in your real-time messaging bus or you have experience in outage, but historical data? Um, for historical data, we can grab the data from the vendor. If we've missed a month's worth of data, we can go back to the vendor and we can get it that way. That's painful, generally. Um, so our first port of call is simply not to miss any data in the first place. Um, but if worse comes to worse, if, if you know, two years later, we find that there's a particular research team who have a strategy in mind and they desperately need three months' worth of data that for whatever reason we're missing, we can get it, but we'd prefer just not to miss it in the first place. Yes, and vendors, vendors are quite understanding this is, this is a common use case, so they, they provide files or they have access and you can read them and process them. It's, it's a bit of a patch job, obviously. Um, but it doesn't happen that often. Plus, uh, for small blips, there's something called data conflation. So uh, most vendors provide data confla conflation if you miss a couple of ticks, um, right, a couple of milliseconds worth of ticks, uh, they will encode the data in the, in the follow-up ticks. Hey, yeah, thanks for the presentation as well. Um, just more interested in, the, in, the, in your performance and throughput charts, you were seeing some very high peak performance there. Interested what sort of infrastructure you find that you need for Kafka to, to cover that sort of, that sort of demand? Uh, that? The, the, yeah, so the peaks in there are high, so you may get three billion messages, and not in that day, obviously, but on the peak times, they'll be much faster than the yep. average of three billion across a day. Yep. So it's interesting what, what what sort of setup you need on Kafka to, to make it handle that? It's nothing massively special. Uh, powerful boxes, obviously every topic is sharded across eight different partitions. So the actual Kafka topic itself is across a few different boxes. Um, we don't use the, it's more for reading actually than, than writing. Um, we try and do things in Python as much as possible. You ain't gonna get this throughput in Python. Um, so on the, when we take things off Kafka, we don't decode them to the raw form in Python. We have Cypher extensions that do that for us. Um, other than that, honestly, it's, it's nothing particularly special or innovative. Um, sometimes we do get backed up. Um, it's not the end of the world um, because, as you can see, the throughput is not constant. Uh, things come and go. Um, 
if it was if it was kind of peak all the way through, yes, we need a different infrastructure. Um, it's happily not peak all the way through. Um, it's, it's basically horizontal scale, and it, you know, just just keeping it elastic. Um, as I said, we're doing it through powerful hardware uh, and basically running everything sharded. As a matter of fact, uh, I think eight is a typical partition count, but for very heavy feeds, we have up to 32 partitions, and they, they cluster the data together. So ultimately, you have you know you have lots of processes running, um, you have lots of threads, each thread per partition. It's not that bad, so it, it's doable. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is about uh, data reliability. Data so reliability. Can, can you reliability. Okay. Uh, yeah. At Kafka level, it is understand, underst understood that uh, Kafka can handle that. But how do you handle that at real time message bus? How do you ensure that uh, the data is not lost or uh, it's not duplicated or needs to be processed uh, at uh, real time bus uh, message bus? Because I see everything depends on the data for you, and it need, you need to make sure that the data is right and the, you expect what is coming there. Uh, we, we have no way of ensuring. If we have missed something, there is no way to ask the real-time message bus if you have missed something, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, we know, obviously, when we are processing less messages than we expect to for a given point of time. We know how many messages we should be uh, processing at a given point of time on a weekday. Um, if suddenly we see 50% of that, we have to take a look. Um, but if we do drop a message, it, it does happen. But on the real-time message bus, uh, we, we, you know, we effectively fill our buffers and we have to drop a few thousand messages. It has happened. Um, it's, it's not the end of the world as long as we're up and running as quickly as possible. Um, as I say, we're not high-frequency traders, so you know we, we can deal with a little bit of, of, of that. Plus, um, there's a little bit of redundancy in the data. I think we haven't actually touched on that, but we are subscribing to um, a lot of data that's the same, but from different providers. Uh, so sometimes we can't control it, right? We, we had a pipe going down from one of the providers. Data is simply not flowing in. Our system notices that the data has stopped and switches to a different provider. So we have our preferred providers from which we always take the data, but if they go down or if the number of ticks Juices, then you know pipes. You know, we, pipes actually get cut by people, by engineers, which which happens. Uh, quite, so quite literally. It literally, happened yes, it happened ago. recently. Uh, so yes, we just switched to a different provider. Uh, data might be slightly of lower quality, uh, but we, we still um, ensure that the data flows through the system. Um, actually, the tick processor that we didn't go over on the right um, is meant to be kind of stream aware. So if one goes down, it knows exactly which one to pick up next. Um, it actually individually looks at the fields to decide which one is most suitable to take highest priority if all of them are up. Um, but we try and be fairly intelligent if it does go down, which does happen. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, great talk. Um, you mentioned at the beginning you're kind of medium to low frequency traders. So why do you deem it necessary to collect your data at such a fine granularity? And um, well, just because we're medium to low frequency traders doesn't mean we don't want to be able to store everything over time to identify trades where possible or to identify strategies where possible. So when we talk about medium to low, we're saying that's the speed at which we trade or the length of time we hold the positions for. Obviously, mm. the data that goes into making the decision should be, mm. as, I mean, it, it, that doesn't change because you need to have the most, the best fidelity, the, be the best view of the world when you come to making that decision. And we are making that decision not as humans, but as computers, which means you know, we are also accountable, our, our algorithms are accountable, essentially. So it doesn't change what comes into the system, it just changes the frequency at which it flows out of the system. Um, so I, that, that's, that's not really, you know, it's not really a question. Um, all of us, no matter which frequency trading we're in, all of us will be storing and collecting this data. Uh, we have time for one more question. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk once more. Uh, in terms of uh, your open source projects, do you, do you see people who are not actively involved with Man Group to contribute to them? And is it a big amount of people? It's a quick, quick, quick we question. We do sometimes. It's not a huge amount of people. Um, uh, other firms do use it, uh, Arctic in particular, which is effectively a data frame store. Um, it is very useful for that. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly how many external contributors we have. I we have, we have a, a few. How many um, stars do we have, do you know? No. 
Okay. <laughs> we, have, we have a couple, uh, and uh, people, it's kind of people who stop using it, they find it useful and they keep using it. Uh, we, it's extremely useful to us internally, so it's not something that we're ever going to drop. Uh, plus, with Arctic Native, I think that the adoption would be higher because uh, it's, it's quite smart. We'll probably publish some papers about it. We've implemented the whole thing internally. Um, it, it aims to solve a problem that hasn't really been solved before. You know, a versioned access to data, so data is audited and data can also be rewound um, based on the day. Um, so I think that that will get a, a wider adoption. I mean, Arctic itself is mature software. Um, yeah. Every bit of kind of quantitative uh, time series data at the entire company is stored using Arctic, and the entire company yeah. rests Absolutely. on its Absolutely. ability Absolutely. to be able to store and access it. Thank you very much. Cool, let's give them a round of applause, please.